Good morning, everyone. Nice, sunshiny day. I want to welcome everybody this morning, any visitors we have, especially. Uh, there are uh, just a couple of announcements here in the bulletin I'll go over. One is uh, today will be the lunch after service. Everybody's invited. And then our uh, monthly business meeting. And, uh, and then it also in here talks that uh, Vacation Bible School is getting real close to starting. So let's keep that in mind. And I know there are still some needs for uh, items they need for Vacation Bible School. And they're all here on your... Uh, on your bulletin. Anybody else have any announcements? Prayer concerns. I do have several pr prayer concerns here. Um, a couple people are, uh, looks like they're going to have to have some surgery, some pretty serious stuff. Manuel, Manuel Hernandez, uh, his dad, John Hernandez, lives there in Moline, uh, having some problems. And uh, Brooke Edwards uh, is also, both of them are uh, uh, pretty ill and need, need our prayers. And uh, we heard this morning that Perry Bruner, who grew up there in Moline, his brother Alan and his brother Rod both live in Moline. Perry passed away either last night or this morning. So, want to keep all of them in your prayers. Any other prayers? Okay. Janice? Sure, sure. That's what I was getting ready to say. Our nation needs prayers. There's so much division, hatred even, uh, within our country. And we need to pray. We can somewhat unite and get along. Uh, so let's do remember that. How about praises? Okay. Anything else? Well, uh, Doug came up and said that uh, Kelly's parents are getting ready to celebrate the 69th wedding anniversary. That's Pat and Jerry Gray, and uh, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Doug has a card he's going to pass around and like to have people sign it if they would. How about birthdays? All right. All right, let's sing to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Um, just a few things. We talked about prayer. We talk about um, things happening in our nation. These election guides are, are still in the back. These are not to uh, point anybody to vote for a specific individual. These are just guidelines to pray for the election in general. Um, they're good guidelines. You can pick them up back there where uh, Marvin's standing. And uh, I know we can always pray on our own, 
anywhere or anytime because it's a conversation with the Lord. But there is something special about corporate prayer. And we have corporate prayer here every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I really think um, where we're at in the scriptures and what you see on the television and you read in the newspapers, it's a wake-up call for America. It's a wake-up call for the church to stand up, to pray, to be who he's called us to be. And we can't do that without a work of the Holy Spirit within the church. And as we begin the worship service, guys, I'm going to read from the book of Ezekiel. And a lot of people think about, you know, we come to church and we have, you know, some music and we have some preaching and we have some fellowship. And sometimes we can easily get caught in the trap of just, this is something that I'm going to observe and watch. I don't want you to think like that this morning. What I want you to think in your own heart and your mind is, this is something I want to enter into. These aren't just words that we're just going to float around today in the, in the sanctuary. These are words that are going to come from the heart. And we can enter into God's presence as God's people here this morning. As we worship together, as we hear his word through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to begin with Ezekiel chapter 36. 36 and 37 of Ezekiel are pretty powerful passages. In verse 27, he says these words, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. And then verse 14 of chapter 37, he says, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Friends, there is no life without the Spirit of God. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, as we see the world getting darker. We see life just waning away. Lord, we know that our hope, it's not in a man. It's not in a, a political affiliation. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And Lord, you said he's our living hope. And it's in Jesus we find our peace. It's in Jesus we find our rest. And it's in Jesus we find our life. We pray, Lord, this morning, as we enter into your presence, Lord, that this wouldn't just be something that we do on a Sunday morning, but this is something that we actually enter into, body, mind, and spirit, Lord. You said that you desire people who worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, may that be our cry this morning. May it be in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may it be in the truth of the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, as the hymn is prayed, come Holy Spirit, dark is the hour. We need your filling, we need your love, and we need your mighty power. Move among us, stir us, we pray. Come Holy Spirit, revive your church today. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you'd like to stand and join us this morning, we're going to start with 363, or sorry, 373. Does Jesus care? I was listening to this song yesterday, and uh, yesterday was a hot one. Amen. <laughs> and I was sweating it out and uh, banging my head on stuff and smashing fingers, and all the while listening to this song, and I thought, yes, Jesus cares. He cares enough that he gave his life. And he promised that we don't have an eternity of banging our heads and smashing our fingers. So if you got something on your heart today, if you feel weighed down, I just want you to know that Jesus does care. And uh, you're in the right place. Does Jesus care? 
When my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song, as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long oh yes he cares i know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary i know my savior cares does jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear as the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary i know my savior cares does jesus care when i've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong when for my deep grief there is no relief though my tears flow all the night long oh yes he cares i know is touched with my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary i know my savior cares does jesus care when i've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks is it art to him does he care oh yes he cares i know is touched with my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary i know my savior cares you may be seated I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough 
Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid Show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley Oh, and there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Amen. God, I just thank you that uh, you're so powerful and amazing. And Lord, you do, you, you turn mourning to dancing. God, I just, uh, just pray that you draw our hearts to focus on you today. Instead of our problems, instead of everything we got going on. 
God, I just pray that you would just turn our eyes to you. You are a great, great God. And our problems are so small compared to your majesty and your glory. God, we just pray for your presence here today, Lord. Just soften our hearts. Come into our lives and speak to those places that are dark that we're holding on to, those places that we're trying to dwell and trying to hunker down and live in self-pity. God, I just pray you'd shine a light there. Let us know that's okay. There is nowhere we can go that we can't be found by you. And you're the deliverer. You're the savior. It literally means that you have come to save us from all this and all these problems that we're going through. God, just change our perspective today as we, as we sing this, as we hear these words. Lord, help them to be true and help them to come from our hearts. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, all will see. How great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
God, sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Father, we come to you this morning uh, thankful, thankful for where we are, Lord, where we live. Um, we're thankful, Lord, for the, just the ability to come here and worship you, Lord, and fellowship. Uh, we're thankful for the nation that we live in, Lord, and want to offer a special prayer for our, for our nation this morning, the, uh, the division and the hatred need to go away, Lord. I think everyone needs to take the words of our pledge that we're one nation under God indivisible and take it to heart, Lord. At this time now, I pray for this offering, Lord, and bless it to you. And We pray, Lord, that we would use it wisely and in the work that we do to, to further your work here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Please rise for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. I think the uh, children can be dismissed for uh, Children's Church at this time. As they make their way out, just really quick on the announcements in your bulletin, if you notice there's just one change there on Wednesday, we're going to be decorating for VBS down at the Methodist Church, so uh, prayer is still in the morning, but there's no Bible study on Wednesday, uh, prepping out for, for VBS down here at the Methodist Church. Um, we got a message this morning from the book of Revelation. Are you guys enjoying the, the study in Revelation? Uh, I'm a, about a chapter and a half ahead of you guys, and I've been studying through the throne room, and guys, what a blessing Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 are. We're making our way right now through the churches. Uh, we come to the church of Sardis this morning, and as you've noticed, Jesus Christ is... 
He's not playing around with his church. And here in the, is the church of Sardis in chapter 3. There's only a few verses to get through this morning, but there's a lot to it, I think. So we're going to look at the message, Dead or Alive, this morning. Revelation chapter 3, if you have your Bible. I invite you to turn with me there to Revelation chapter 3. And let's stand to honor the Word of God. As we look at these verses, I invite you to keep your Bible open because I'm going to reference a few things as we go through this this morning. The letters to the seven churches, to the church in Sardis, chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Let's pray. Breath of life comes sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Breath of life come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this hour. May it be done, Lord, through your spirit and through your word and through your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anybody ever work in a hospital or been in the hospital and seen the crash cart come through? The old crash cart with the paddles? You know things are crazy when you see the crash cart come into the room, right? Well, the divine physician, Jesus Christ, doesn't play this morning. He comes into the church of Sardis. He lifts the top off of Sardis, and he looks at the paddles, and he says, we have a dead church. The wake-up call is here, church. The Lord Jesus Christ says to his church this morning, wake up. Wake up. The question I want to consider with you this morning is very simple. Are you dead or are you alive? Simple. Are you dead or are you alive? Let me ask you a question this morning. What do you think of when I say, that's a dead church? Most likely when I say a dead church, most people think of, it's probably a small little church somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. It's maybe got a few older folks you know, in it, it's dwindling away, there's not a lot of money in the bank, you know, that's probably a dying church. What we look at this morning in the book of Revelation is we find out that's actually not a dead church. We actually find the opposite. So this morning, I want to consider three things with you. Very simply, the pronouncement of death upon the church, the cause of death, which I think is super important, And then the resurrection of a dead church. The pronouncement of death, the cause of death, and the resurrection from death. Let's look at the church of Sardis. Let's look at the pronouncement of death. I want you to visualize it in your minds. The great physician, Jesus Christ, the one who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. We know the seven stars are the pastors of the churches. He comes into the waiting room. He comes into the hospital room, and he says there in verse 1, you may want to highlight this. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. I'm going to say that again. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. 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 We should all just be blown back in our seats right now. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Oh, I know your works. So a dead church isn't really what we think a dead church is. This is not a church where you got some type of defunct pastor up in the pulpit withering away. There's, this is not a church where they only have a couple dollars in the bank account. This is not a church that's barely hanging on. No, no. This is actually the opposite. This is the alarming part to this. If you Google First Baptist Sardis, it probably comes up five stars. 
is probably a very good church that you would want to attend. It is the happening place in town. Hmm? It has a reputation of being alive. What's a reputation? It's what people think you are. Oh, you have a name. If you would survey the community out here in the Sardis community, what would they say about the Church of Sardis? They would say this. The worship, oh, it's vibrant. The preaching down at Sardis, it is powerful preaching in Sardis. The children's, the children's ministry, it's amazing in Sardis. Oh, you just, you just look at that church. They got this thing going on down in Sardis. This thing's alive. They have a name in the, in the community. They have a name out in the public. Oh, they have a name. They're serious about Jesus and Sardis. Hey, what do people say about us? What do people say about First Baptist Church of Howard in the community? Can I say as your pastor, I don't care what people say. I care what Jesus Christ says. That's the only one that matters. I don't care what Jim, Bob, and Joe, and Smo, and anybody else says about First Baptist Church of Howard. I want to know what the great physician says about First Baptist Church of Howard. Well, he says of Sardis, you have a name, but you're dead. He doesn't say you're almost dead. He doesn't say you're becoming dead. He says you are flatlined. You don't even have a pulse in Sardis. He says, when I look at Sardis, you know what I see? I see a bunch of people that are walking around like a bunch of zombies. Like, you know, the night of the living dead. That's what he sees in Sardis. This is scary, guys. As a pastor, these, these letters are frightening. Why? Because this is what this means. We can talk like we're alive. We can sing like we're alive. We can preach like we're alive. We can pray like we're alive. We can carry our Bible like we're alive and be dead. That's crazy. This is, it's like a funeral. You ever been to one of those visitations? Aren't they, let's be honest, they're sort of, they're sort of crazy. Think about, a, think about a visitation for a moment. You go into a funeral home, and they have this person that has passed away, made up with makeup, and they look so alive. It is made to look so real and so alive. Can we put that down a second, for a second, sir? We're teaching the Word of God here. Thank you. Everything is made to look alive. There's food, there's music, there's entertainment, and look, but the main thing is death. The whole topic is death. Everything's made to look alive, but it's all about death. Friends, we don't want to have a name. And Jesus Christ say, you are dead. You are dead. Friends, what a reputation is this? What people think you are. Character is what Jesus knows us to be. And that is the most important thing. Here's the thing. This is what's so frightening about this church. You can put your name, First Baptist Church, on your sign and be a catacomb. You can put... Christian in front of your name and be comatose. That's the scary part. One commentator put it like this. We must never let the vibrancy of our singing or the intensity of our preaching nor the consistency of our attendance lull us to sleep and become a cover-up for the absence of spiritual vitality. Jesus comes into the room this morning and says, you're dead. You're dead. What causes death? Because I think as a church, we want to know this, don't we? You want to know what causes a church to die? Do you want to know what causes a Christian to die? I do. I really want to know. I have a couple things here just to mark off. And I think this is the most important thing, guys. If you're a note taker, you might want to just take a note of it. A church and a Christian will die, spiritually speaking, when we live independently 
of the Holy Spirit. When you start to operate apart from the Holy Spirit of God, when you start to operate in the flesh, and you say, where do you get this out of the text? I believe you can see this in verse 1. He who has what? The seven spirits of God. Remember what the seven spirits of God were? Seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of completion. Hmm? The seven spirit is the complete, the full, the perfect work of the Holy Spirit. And every description that Jesus gives to the churches, there's something that that church needs or that something that church needs to glean from. And in the description that Jesus gives of himself to Sardis, he says, I have the seven spirits of God, the complete, the full, perfect work of the Holy Spirit as seen in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 in the Old Testament. And whenever a church, you can mark it down, you can write this in stone, whenever a church moves away from depending on the Holy Spirit, life will end up flowing out of that church. It will flow out of it. That is why I spent, I know most people were probably like, are you done with this yet? I spent over, we spent over a year teaching through the Holy Spirit, a whole entire year on the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he is the one who births the church. He's the one who strengthens the church. He's the one who breathes life into the church. You take the Holy Spirit out, you have, you have a name, but you're dead. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important. I know the kids are getting back ready to get back to school, and I know everybody's so enthused about that. Just look, you can look at their faces, and they're so excited. Now, here's a simple math equation. This isn't complicated math. It's simple math. No spirit, no life. No spirit, no life. John 6, 6 63 says, The spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible says, The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. There's only one thing that gives life to a church. There's only one thing that gives life to a Christian. It is the breath, the ruach, the spirit of God blowing on a congregation. Ezekiel chapter 37. Here we go into the valley of dry bones. Question, God says, son of man, can those dry bones live? Lord, you know if they can live. Ezekiel, son of man, this is what I want you to do. I want you to speak forth the word of God to them. And I want you to pray from the four winds that the breath of God come in. And what happens? Flesh comes on, sinews come on. And then they finally live when God breathes life in. The Spirit of God. Church, you can grow a church numerically and physically through the arm of the flesh. How? It's easy. Let me tell you how you do it. You get enough money in the bank, okay? You get the most talented musicians on the stage. You get the most charismatic individual in the pulpit. You get the greatest technology that money can buy, and you can grow a church numerically. But here's the thing. We don't just want bodies in a pew who are spiritually dead. We want bodies in the pew who are spiritually alive. We don't want to be a church who has a name that you're alive but you are dead because Timothy or Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, he said that in the last days, this is what's going to happen. And I think we're in the last of the last days right now. He said, this is what's going to happen, Timothy. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power thereof. They're going to look like a church. They're going to talk like a church. They're going to sing like a church. They're going to preach like a church but they're going to deny the power thereof. I don't want to be, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be part of that. A.W. Tozer, I believe he was a prophet for his own time. He said this of the 20th century church. Listen to these scathing words. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we would do would still go on and nobody would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit 
had been withdrawn from the New Testament church in the book of Acts, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Hmm? What did the book of Acts teach us? The first church had no smoke machines. The first church had no screens. The first church had no technologies and arms of the flesh and all this other stuff. This is what they had. They had a Bible, and they had the Holy Spirit of God. That is what brings life to the church. That is what... So when we live independently of the Holy Spirit, life wanes. Second thing, when we get comfortable... When we get comfortable. You say, where do you see that at in the text? That is in the history of Sardis. If you look at the history of Sardis, you have to do a little bit of reading for this. Sardis lived in this area where they thought they were impregnable. You weren't going to take Sardis. They lived on this mountaintop area, and you weren't coming in. But the thing about Sardis was this. Two times they were taken. And how were they taken? In the text, Jesus says, I'm going to come to you like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night, two times in history, Sardis was taken by storm. Oh, you can't touch us. Yeah, we can touch you. They were taken like a thief. When we become comfortable, and if you notice something about the church in Sardis, you notice this? There's no Jezebel talked about. There's no Nicolaitans talked about. There's no Balaam talked about. The church is their own worst enemy. This church was a place of softness, a place of luxury, and a place of money. One of the guys, one of the kings of Sardis was a man by the name of King Croesus, and he was one of the first people to mint coins. Money wasn't a thing in Sardis. Money wasn't a thing at the church of Sardis. They had donors on standby. You have a need? We got it. I have a donor. We're going to get that money. It'll get taken care of. I know a lot of the farmers today, they're out in the hay field. Now, I've never been in the hay field, but I can ima- I've been in some hot trucks. I can imagine it's pretty hot. Now, what happens when you come in after a hot, 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 hot day? You know, Travis was talking about hot day. And you get that cool air blowing on you. You got that nice glass of iced tea by you. And you got that nice soft couch, and you, you just you put your legs up on that couch. And you just start to... Start to nod it off. Start to nod it off. Why? We just got comfortable. And this is the state that the church was living in. They had comfort. They had ease. And it brought them to a place of moral laxity. And what did the comfort do? It caused them not to finish what they started. Why is it so hard for Super Bowl champions to repeat the Super Bowl or World Series champions to repeat the, the World Series. This is why. They can do it, but it's hard. And they, most people don't. Why? Because once they taste that victory, they lose their hunger. They lose that drive. I already, got, I already got the ring, man. I got the ring. I don't need it anymore. I got one. Are we hungry for the Word of God? Are we hungry for more of Jesus Christ? We cannot let comfort and our blessings and our leisure overtake the hunger that we need, the hunger that we must have for Jesus Christ, his word and his spirit. He says in verse 2, I have not found your works complete. That means they're not finished. You're not finished. How many people do you see today start things? They don't finish it. Oh, I'm going to start this. Oh, I'm going to get involved in this. And then I'm done. I'm not going to follow through this thing. Listen, if God lays something on your heart, you will have opposition not to finish it. Can I encourage you this morning? Maybe God has laid something on your heart this morning and you put it on the back burner. 
guess what? Today is the time to put it back on the front burner. Put all the other stuff and all the other things on the back burner. It's time to finish what we started because what Satan has done in the American church today is he has inoculated and pumped into the church comfort and ease. And we start to trust in horses and we start to trust in chariots. And guess what happens? We sit back a little, we put our feet up on the thing, we have a glass of iced tea, and guess what? We stop pressing in. We stop pressing in. We, start, we stop driving into the word. Oh, I already know that passage. I'm good. Can't stay. You say, is that happening? Yes, it's happening. It's happening, church. When I first came here, Bible study on Wednesday was flushed. Flushed. Where's everybody at? Get comfortable. I, oh, what's going on? Hey, how about prayer? Hey, what's going on? We can't get, I say it to me. I say it to you. We cannot, it's easy for me, trust me. The pastoral job comes with a lot of flex and leisure. You know what I'm saying? You have able to juggle your schedule around and maneuver things and piece things together. And it comes with, you can easily pull back and say, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to chill. We can't chill. We can't. We got to keep pressing forward. We have to finish what we start. Dr. Rayner, this is a good book. Autopsy of a Dead Church. He interviewed one man and he said, quote, listen to this, church died. Quote, we stopped praying with passion we once had. That's it. We stopped praying with passion that we once had. That, be, that, that was the beginning of the decline that led to our death. Simply, we stopped taking prayer serious. Shh. Why would you do that? If you got comfortable, I don't need to pray. I'm good. Dr. Ravenhill said this. He's a fiery little preacher. He said, you want to know how popular your church is come Sunday morning? You want to know how popular the pastor is come Sunday night? Pastor's not popular because we shut that thing down. Want to see how popular God is? Come to the prayer meeting. We don't want to know that we're alive or dead. We want to be alive and be alive. The third thing that led to the death, they lived in their past glory. They lived independent of the Holy Spirit. They lived in a very comfort, leisure-filled life, and they lived in the past glory. You would walk around the streets of Sardis, and you would hear these things. Oh, remember Sardis? Oh, the glory days. We were once a strong city in Sardis, and we had it happening in Sardis, but it was an empty shell of a city now. And Dr. Rayner in his book, listen carefully, this is so important. If you have ears, please. The, he said the common thread, the common thread in a dying church is this. You ready? You may want to mark it down. They hold on to the past at the expense of the future. I'm going to say that again. They hold on to the past at the expense of the future. They live off past money. They live off past ministry. They live off a past man, a past pastor, a past. They live off the past. Vance Havner, great theologian, he said there's four stages to your ministry. And he said the four sta stages of a ministry are go like this. It starts with a man. God raises up a man filled with the Holy Spirit, and he starts something. It turns into a movement. People catch the fire. They catch the spirit, and it becomes a movement. You know, the Jesus people movement. That was a movement of Almighty God. It was a spirit moving in the people. Then it turns into a machine. It turns into a machine. You just start cranking it out. Start cranking it out. It's all about the numbers. Just start cranking it out. And then that individual usually dies, and then it turns into a monument. And then that monument, it's almost worshipped, and then it turns into a morgue, and it dies. And you, again, this happens in the church today, friends. Let me tell you how. You remember, and it was just back in the day, 
It was just the old hymns. It was the piano. And it was something, man. We had it. We had it. Don't hold on to the past at the expense of the future. Okay? Or how about this? You know, back in the day, man, we were ministering to a ton of kids, and we were doing this, and we were doing A, B, C, and D. We had all these things hopping off and popping off. Hey, what are you doing now? Past is the past. What are you doing? Look, look, Jesus said, open your eyes. The harvest is ripe. There are kids here now. There are people here now. There is ministry opportunity here now. Jesus said, listen, he said in Isaiah 43, verse 19, behold, I am doing a new thing. What new thing does God want to do in your life? What new thing does he want to do in this church? How many people say this? Oh, you know, God spoke in 2011 to me this verse. What is God speaking to you now? What does he want to speak to you? The church that is independent of the Spirit will die. The church that lives a complacent life will die. The church stuck in the past will die. I have good news. You want some good news this morning? Yeah? I know somebody. I know somebody. You want to know who I know? The one who said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. And if anyone believes on me, even though he dies, he shall live. Do you know what? Jesus Christ can raise a dead church. Do you know Jesus Christ can raise a dead marriage? Do you know Jesus Christ can raise a dead man? How many people have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ in here this morning? I have. Lisa brought out some old pictures. She said, old pictures of Pastor Derek. Mm -hmm. Old pictures. I'm not going to show them to you. I looked at that guy. In all seriousness, they were some goofy pictures. I was a dead man walking. I thought I knew what life was all about. I had no idea what life was all about until Jesus came into my life and the Spirit of God opened my eyes and opened my heart and things became, guess what? Brand new. Jesus has a couple words. He says, you want new life? Here's what you do. Ready? Wake up. That's the first step one. A lot of times, how many you, when you're sleeping, you don't know you're sleeping, right? You need your like spouse or something. Hey, wake up. Wake up. Hey, kids, time to go to school. Wake up. Jesus says, hey, wake up. Wake up. He says there, be watchful. You see that in the text? Be watchful. What we need today, church, is not sleeping beauties in the church. We need walking warriors in the church. Romans 13, 11 says, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is near. Look around, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is coming back. What's he going to find? Is he going to find a church filled with faith or a church falling asleep? I pray that he finds us awake. He says, wake up. Second thing, finish up. Wake up, finish up. Verse 2, strengthen the things that remain. Let that be a word to somebody in here this morning. Strengthen the things that remain. That's a good word, isn't it? You say, I don't have a lot right now, Pastor. You don't, we're going through a lot right now. It's a season where there's not a whole lot. I, I don't have a whole lot. I'm hanging on by a thread. Maybe you're hanging on by a thread here this morning. Jesus says, that's okay. I want you to strengthen that little thread. You say, I'm fizzling out. That's okay. The Bible says he's not going to quench a smoldering wick. Somebody said this. He's the Lord of what's left. You have a little bit left in your tank. That's okay. But you know what? God doesn't need, actually, he doesn't need anything. You know what? He created the universe, the Bible says, ex nihilo, out of nothing. He doesn't need anything. He needs, even if you have a little bit, what's he do with a little bit? If you have a mustard seed of faith, a little mice, mountains can move. If you have a staff, seas can split. If you have a stone, giants can fall. If you have a couple fish, multitudes can be fed. Jesus 
doesn't need a lot. He says, I want whatever you have left, that little bit you have left, it's okay. Strengthen that up. You have a, I have a little bit of prayer in my life. That's okay. Strengthen that thing up. You know, I've got a little bit of devotion life in my, you know, my devotions are waning. I have a little bit of that left. That's okay. Strengthen what remains. It'll, it'll grow. God will grow it. Strengthen it up. Hey, what's unfinished? What needs to be tightened up? What needs to be strengthened up? Wake up. Finish up. Last thing, back up. Back up. Verse 3, he says, remember. That's a big word in Revelation, remember. Remember what? Remember what you already know. Hey, you've heard the word. You read your Bibles. Hey, remember what you heard and do it. Do it. Hold fast to it. That was last week. Hold fast to it. Church, we don't need new sermons. We just need to do old sermons. That's what we need. A pastor went into a church, new pastor, and he went up to the pulpit for four weeks. Same message. You must be born again. Imagine if I preached that every week, born again, born again. The deacons came up to him, pastor, deacon, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you preaching you must be born again? Because the pastor looked at the deacon and said, because you must be born again. Until you're born again, until you have the Spirit of God working in your life, he says, nothing else is going to help. We can't go any further until you're born again. Until the Spirit of God awakens your soul. We have to hold fast to what we have. We need to let go of what's holding us back. If there's anything holding you back this morning, you know what it is. Spirit of God might be speaking to you this morning. There's something in your life you're just sort of grasping it a little bit. Hey, I encourage you this morning, just let it go. Let it go. Hold fast to what you know and do it. He says there, repent. There's that word again, repent. That means turn the other direction, go the other way. Finally, the promise. Look at this. These promises. You could just preach sermons on these promises. Verse 5. He who overcomes. Again, the question is, overcomes what? The temptation to be spiritually asleep. He says, I got some things for him. What do you got? What does he have? He says three things. Apparel. He's going to be dressed in white. That could, that could be a, a sense of purity, but it could also be a sense of victory. Victors were often dressed in white robes. He says, I'm going to give you assurance. We're going to get to that in a moment. And then I'm going to acknowledge you before my Father. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Jesus says, I'm going to confess your name before my Father in heaven. Let me look here for a second. Do you see that down in there? I think it's verse 5 or 6. He says, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. People will lift that verse. You see that? You can lose your salvation. You see that? He gonna, he's going to erase your, he has a divine eraser up there. He's waiting for you to mess up. And when you mess up, he's going to take that divine eraser and erase it away. That's not it. Context, 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 context is everything in the Bible. What's he speaking here? He's speaking a promise. This is for encouragement. This is not for discouragement. This is a promise. This isn't about losing salvation. Because listen, every single one of us, the pastor included, if, this, if our names would be blotted out because we messed up, every single one of us are getting blotted out probably a thousand times over. What is this? It's a promise. Listen carefully. The way, you, the way you could read this better is this. I am never, ever, 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 ever going to blot your name out of the book of life. Why? Because it is written in his own blood. It's written in his blood. He's not going to blot you out. Remember, what was the first thing? You have a name, but... You, that you're, that you're alive, but you're dead, hey, I'm not blotting out your name. I'm not blotting out your reputation. I'm going to confess you before my Father. That's what Jesus is saying. Again, the history, 
in the city of Sardis and the old time uh, cities, what would happen is your name would be on a registry, big registry, like a church registry. And when you died, your name would be erased. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to blot out of my book. The city might blot you out, but I am not going to blot you out, and you will be eternally recognized. Jesus says to the one who overcomes, by relying on the Holy Spirit, the one who finishes what they start, the one who refuses to be complacent, I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to dress him in white. I'm going to give him the assurance that I'm never going to blot his name out. And I'm going to confess to him for my father. That, my friend, is a promise. Nobody, no president, nobody can make a promise like that. And as uh, Trav comes up and leads us in that last song, um, I just want to give that invitation to you this morning. Is your name in the book of life? Has your name been written in the book of life? You say, how does, how does my name get written there? You confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You turn from your sin. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I've been trying to do this on my own, and I can't do it anymore. And I need you to make me alive. And guess what? He will. Listen. I look, I know some people in here. I see some faces. I know the power of sin. I'm not just preaching it, guys. And I can see testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony that Jesus changes. Do you want to know that your name will forever be in the book of life? Today's the day you can do that. And if you say, you know what? I know my name is there. I have security and I am so filled with joy. Awesome. Hey, a word to, to you and to me then? Strengthen the things which remain. Don't get caught up in the crazy stuff. Don't be lulled to sleep. Today's the day, guys, to shine the light of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for your word. It's so good. It's so rich. It's so wonderful, Lord. Some of it stings. Some of it heals. And Father, I pray for anybody in here this morning that does not know you personally as their Savior, that today would be the day they simply cry out to you, Lord. It's, it's, it's not difficult. There's no hoops that you make us jump through. There's no things that we have to accomplish. You said the work of God is this, to believe on the one you have sent. And that one you've sent is Jesus. I pray that they would pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I acknowledge, Lord, that I need a Savior. My good deeds cannot bring me to you. My church attendance cannot bring me to you. Only my Savior can bring me to you. I confess you, Lord, today as both my Lord and my Savior. I ask you now, Lord, to forgive me of my sin, to cleanse me of all of the unrighteousness, and to clothe me, Lord, with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit, that I may live for you the rest of my days. And I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in the room, Lord, that today would be a day we'd hear the Savior calling, Wake up, finish up, back up. Pray this in Jesus' name. Living for, ooh, living for Jesus, 363 in your hymns. Living for Jesus, 
a life that is true striving to please him in all that i do yielding allegiance glad hearted and free this is the pathway of blessing for me oh jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be thy throne my life i give henceforth to live O christ for thee alone living for jesus who died in my place bearing on calvary my sin and disgrace such love constrains me to answer his call follow his leading and give him my all O oh, jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be thy throne my life i give henceforth to live O christ for thee alone living for jesus wherever i am doing each duty in his holy name willing to suffer affliction and loss deeming each trial a part of my cross O oh, jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be thy throne my life i give henceforth to live O christ for thee alone living for jesus through earth's little while my dearest treasure the light of his smile seeking the lost ones he died to redeem bringing the weary to find rest in him O oh, jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be thy throne my life i give hence 
forth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Guys, I always warn you, when you hear messages like that, ask the past couple weeks, and you know, you know, it's sort of like, hopefully it's encouraging, it can be very convicting, but the temptation is to try to go out here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm, hey, I'm going to get back to this. We can't do it in our own strength. We have to go in the power of the Holy Spirit every moment, every hour of every day. Because if I try to go out here and try to do all these things, I'll fail. We have to rely on the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, this morning, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Lord, that you would mold us, that you would make us, Lord, that you would use us and that you would fill us that we could serve you, Lord, this week to come. We pray, Lord, that you would receive all the glory and all the honor because Lord, you are worthy of our praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody, again, there's, there's a fellowship meal. Everybody's invited if you want to come.